The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Well, stored in hierarchical tree-like structures to help you understand the concept, we're going to take a look at the problem that I was trying to solve, uh, and then we'll take a look at some of the more common approaches to solving the problem of hierarchical data and relational databases. Uh, then we're going to actually take a look at the l -Tree module and show you how that makes life easier. Finally, I'm making some, I just want to make uh, some basic assumptions that you at least know what PostgreSQL is. PostgreSQL is and have some idea how to get it up and running, know some basic SQL stuff, um, then, and that you can install software on your distribution. My problem is that I wanted to summarize categories, uh, summarize financial transactions by various levels of category. You can accuse Quicken or give Quicken the credit. Uh, you know, it used to be in the old days, you'd go uh, to the grocery store, uh, you buy groceries, you come home, and you put in the receipt and call it groceries uh, in Quicken. I, what is it? Yeah. Um, in your case, you may be wanting to actually summarize demographic data for a multinational uh, conglomerate corporation thing that, where you want to know data by continent, nation, state, county, city, zip, uh, you know, that kind of thing, neighborhood. Uh, up to seven levels of depth here, uh, or your, your taxonomy or uh, structure may go deeper than that. In my case, I had a category structure something like 200 categories wide, uh, and you see the levels of depth here, uh, the numbers of categories at each level of depth. So what you're seeing is you're seeing a tree that varies has some have some branches are longer than others, more uh, more deep than others. This is just a cross section of my category tree. And I want you to know, you go and show this to your wife. This is a test. Show it to your wife, and see how long it takes for her to get a headache. How many of you are already getting a headache? I mean, you start looking at these numbers, and you're just going, "Well, what the heck?" And all I'm showing here is I'm just showing income and expenses, utilities, groceries, and transportation. But I have these broken down even further so that I've got a difference in the, the, you know, the types of food that I buy. And even down to the beverages, alcohol, and truthfully, I'm even further than that. I have it down into beer, wine, and spirits. <laughs> So what I wanted to be able to do, and I had the hardest time getting people to get this on the, on the mailing lists when I was trying to figure out how to solve this problem, I wanted to see things by utilities, groceries, and transportation. All right? Well, you know, if you, when you start get, adding these levels of categories into a relational database management system, that's kind of like fitting square pegs into triangular holes ain't happening. Um, so, and if you try to show that to a busy executive, even, you're going to get the same response as what my wife gave me. I don't care about all these stupid numbers. Just show me some of the basic stuff. There you go. There's our government mandated warning. Uh, do note that, um, on the other hand, IRS auditors got really excited at seeing such details. Although I'm guessing from the news these days, the IRS agents are not really excited about those details getting out to the public. Uh, but in order to help you see what I wanted, where I wanted to get to, this is where I wanted to get to. These are my income and expenses uh, more or less, uh, and there's no 
time period here, so we're just showing everything in the database at this particular, whenever I took this screenshot. Um, but really, 18 rows, that's much easier to understand. And even better, I can pull that into LibreOffice Calc and create a pie chart. Now my wife can get a, her head around the pie chart. A busy executive can get his or her head around a pie chart. This is awesome. But getting here was not easy. Most of the solutions I found required me to create lots of columns and that were going to have null values and no DBA really wants a bunch of null values in their database. Or I'd need queries. I didn't even have any clue how to write. Or I'd need one query repeated for all of the branches of the category tree. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, 18 to, repeating the same query 18 to 20 times, heck, now I need to start learning programming, you know, gee whiz. Or create views and temp tables just to be able to get the, in other words, it's getting really convoluted. Ah, yeah, data warehousing. When I asked this question to, to DBA gurus, you know what they told me? You need a data warehouse. Uh, yeah. Cue the Lord of the Rings music here. I wanted one query to rule them all. I just wanted something simple to go up and down my category tree. I just wanted to be able to summarize things. I didn't want to have to go through all this junk. So what are some of the things that I went through before I found L-Tree? I went out and I did some homework. And the first thing I found was an adjacency list model. This, is, this actually gets taught in your average DBA course. Uh, the nested set, path enumeration, data warehousing. These are the most common approaches that I found. And the truth is, I really don't, didn't care for any of them when I was start work trying to work with them, and I don't care for any of them now. But then I discovered L-Tree. Um, and there was, I mentioned, uh, or I had on the slide there about uh, one of those being possibly, or some variation being a, a even patented. So you got to kind of watch yourself how you do things. Again, the adjacency list, this is what's taught in your average DBA 110 class, and it is literally, it's just a recursive tree, or a recursive table. So you have employee ID 1, and all you do is you, your manager ID refers back to the employee ID for the whoever is the manager. That's pretty simple. Uh, if you're familiar with EF Codd, uh, he actually wrote about this. He's sort of the father of modern relational database systems. Um, wrote about this model. The nested set theory, or nested set model, uh, it's more difficult to understand at first. It really takes you some time. I still haven't gotten my head around this one. I mean, I stole this, stole, borrowed, whatever you want to call it, from Wikipedia because I was afraid if I drew my own nested set graph that somebody here would be able to call me on my screwing it all up. <laughs> okay. So I included the link to Wikimedia for you there, so if... Uh, for references sake. So thanks to Wikipedia. Now this one is actually, I want to say to some extent, easier to work with. The path enumeration model, you create a path here and I think technically you're supposed to be able to use uh, pattern matching to go up and down your tree. Unfortunately, me not being a brilliant rocket scientist type, I goofed up and really didn't know much how to implement pattern matching in my database, so, you know, just shoot me, if you will. Uh, so that added to my difficulties. It is advantageous when the tree is of limited depth and then you're not going to modify it much. Um, and my original design was based on this, uh, but I used this form of a path instead of what you see here. So just a little bit variation. There's a downside to these approaches. 
I, when, I asked, when I showed my DBA 110 professor my enumerated path model, she looked at me and she said, that's not normalized. You need to, I can't wait for us to get to the normalization chapter so you can see about normalization. Well, she's actually right. I, and I, you know, inside I was kind of going, all right, let's put up your dukes here. I did my research on this. I, this is the model that, that many other people use. And you're telling me it's not normalized? Well, actually, she's right. <laughs> Thank you, Joe Selko, for clarifying that for me. Um, but you have to take measures to prevent data anomalies from entering your database with these various models. The adjacency list starts becoming unwieldy when you get a larger tree. The nested set is a pain in the neck to learn, and it's slow on updates. It's very fast to retrieve your data. It's a, I understand it's, it's beautiful code on, when it comes time to retrieve, but it's slow on updates because you, now you have to update every single branch effectively. Uh, path enumeration, again, that seems to be the better. With pattern matching, you're okay, but you also wind up writing common table expressions. These are queries I don't know how to write, and I know DB gurus, professional DBAs, who would have, who it would take them some time to write a, a common table expression that would work for what I wanted to do. Yeah, there you go. There's our common table expression with recursive. This is 11 lines of code here. And I haven't even introduced a time frame yet. We're just talking about show me everything in the database. If I want to see, say, show me everything, all the uh, financial transactions between, the sum of the financial transactions between January and March, now I have to add in the dates in here somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can you guys see how this might be difficult for somebody who doesn't really, you know, who hasn't, doesn't have 10 years experience as a DBA. You'll see that uh, we're going to trim that down by quite a bit. Data warehousing, I mentioned this just briefly. I don't even know anything about data warehousing much. I, I know I get the idea, the concept behind it, but I've not ever implemented data warehousing. But I'm trying to do this for a personal financial transaction database why do I want a data warehouse for this? I may not be the brightest bulb in the chandelier, but at least I got the idea that that might be overkill. So let's just be honest with ourselves. We are in Mordor. Mordor is a deep, dark, ugly place. It, it's, if, you know your, if you know the story, it's not a great place to be. And that's exactly where we are with these approaches to hierarchical data. Well, if you remember, Frodo got out of there and he went the way of the elves. So let's go the way of the elves now. Does it really have, it does, you know, the question is, does it have to be this complicated? No, it doesn't. The L tree module makes all of this much less complicated. L tree is an add-on module. It uses a dotted label path plus pattern matching to perform its magic. And you can write queries so easy that even a troll or myself can figure that out. <coughs> Typically, it is faster than a common table expression or other recursive queries. Yeah, there may be exceptions, but typically you'll find it's a lot faster. And look at the... Look at what I did here. All I did is I created a separate table for the taxonomy. And a, I had a primary key and a path. Continent, continent dot country. All the way down here, continent dot country dot state dot county dot city dot zip underscore code. You can't have any spaces. You can't even use a dash. You have to use an underscore. So if you want to separate names to make it more readable, then you just use an underscore. That's actually important to note. Um, 
to install L tree, again, it's an add-on module. It's really simple. You just use your, your distributions package manager to install the, con the PostgreSQL contrib mod uh, package. Then you log on to Postgres as a super user and connect to the database you want to install L tree. So it, installing it is really a breeze, create extension L tree. Uh, that's really, really hard. Um, to update it, use alter extension L tree to keep it up to date. If you installed a template one, you can obviously make it available to all of your databases that use template one. My database uses template zero and UTF-8. So I hadn't quite figured out how to make it available to all of the, UTF, all the template zero databases. <laughs> one, one got you there, so I have to install it on the individual database in this case. Using the data type, honestly, I think the recommended approach is actually create your taxonomy in a separate table. You can't, it's just a data type. You can use it in any table you want. But if you want to maintain your data integrity and that kind of stuff, uh, if you want to make managing this thing easy, create a separate table. Just do yourself a favor there. Um, I do think it's important to maintain a primary key constraint. I, if, I think, as far as I know, you can do big serial. It's, it's, you know, you're just using a, um, I mean, the, the primary key doesn't really have anything to do. Oh, it's just, that's just a category thing. It's like a yeah. yeah, it's just a primary key field. So, uh, but your, your path field uses this L tree data type. Uh, you can. Some. Depends on the functions. Um, I would recommend looking into the documentation as for the specifics. Um, but yeah, I think you really do need to have some sort of a, um, a unique constraint. Let's just give you an idea of my database here to just make, make things easier. Uh, this is my original category table using the, the enumerated path model. And so this is my new, uh, as cross section of it, using my new uh, L tree version. And you see here, like I said, the groceries.beverages.alcohol.beerwinespirits. Now see, if I, if I see I'm spending too much money on beer and not enough on wine or vice versa, I can adjust my budget. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this is my, I call it the entity table. I, you know, I keep uh, principal, pay, income source, whatever, they're all in one table. I just called them an entity because I don't know, you know how do you call them all? Um, rather than create three different tables, I thought that would be stupid. So, yeah. Uh, it's more or less uh, extraneous data here, but it's one of four tables in my database. Uh, the transaction record table, of course you can't have a table called transaction in a database that has transactional, yeah. The transaction is a reserved keyword. Um, but you can see I've got, what's going to be important to us in a minute here is the transrec ID, the transrec date, uh, the rest of it is pretty extraneous. I, by the way, the nice thing about this is I can even add in an extra column so that I can either include attached scanned receipt documents or at least a link to them. Uh, the details table is the real meat and potatoes of the database. And like I say, the category ID, 
I just assign that base category ID to the particular item. And again, I mentioned earlier, you, back in the old days, you'd go to the grocery store, you'd buy groceries. Well, nowadays, uh, Walmart has gotten into the grocery business. So maybe if I go to Walmart and I buy groceries and I head over to the clothing section, pick up a pair of jeans, go over to automotive, buy some oil for the car, go over, uh, get some plants, and, and then get some dental floss or something. Um, now when I get home, how am I going to categorize this stupid transaction? Well, that's why I put my category tree here. I can line item each, each expense, each item on the receipt, and give them an appropriate category. It takes a little longer uh, to do it that way, but that way everything goes into an appropriate. So the category idea is the, the serial number that you created when you did the other table? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's a, yeah. That's the link. That's the link. Each, each detail has a category. A transaction, if I, if I want to do the, the whole transaction, as a, like for example, when I buy gas. Okay, well there, there's no way I'm gonna split that. Um, but I can just take the total of the receipt and use that as one line item in the... I called it trans details, one could call this table line item. So let's play with some queries here. This is, this is where it gets really cool. This is just a simple query. Uh, <clears throat> if you're familiar with SQL, you know if you want to summarize things, you use the sum function. Uh, and with, sub L, with L tree, you use sub L tree. Uh, sub L tree path. And then these two numbers here are actually the most important numbers here. The zero, the first number, is actually your starting point. The second number is your depth, however deep you want to go. Depth of the category tr uh, structure. So, you know, you, you go back to the, the original table, uh, or my category table. What I'm doing is I'm telling it how, how many dots, basically, I want to go down, is really what I'm doing. Um, zero would be the top level. Yeah. Yes. In fact, if I if I change that one to zero, it's actually going to give me my immediate immediately give me my net cash flow because it's going to sum the whole database. Boom. So if I then want to see, well, first let's go to. This is the result of this transaction, uh, of our previous uh, query. So now you see, and again, there's no date information here, but now you begin to see, you, now we've got 25 categories here. So it, database pro, uh, development, in, in my case, in, as in most, is an iterative process. The first screenshot showed 18 categories. By now, I've developed by the time I got this far along, I developed uh, an additional seven categories. So, you know, but these are all the top level categories. So by, with the zero and one, this is what we see, all of the top level categories. Now we dive down a level. Actually, we're gonna dive down three levels. And again, it's the same query and just remember, we're, we've got category and trans details, and we're connecting them. This is our, you know, we're making our join here. So, and the result, mind you, we get a lot more results this time because we're going down in further into the category tree. So I just brought out a cross section. What this shows you, though, is it under that, notice that, even though we went four levels down, it also summarizes the categories that only are three levels down, or two, or one. So I've got $287 worth of receipts that I never itemized.
Correct. Just the things that he didn't subcategorize. Yeah, that I did not subcategorize. In other words, I took that receipt and I said groceries. I gave it the category ID for groceries. Sure. No problem. Wait, we're you know four four lines of code. It's doubled up because of the screen space, but you know, four lines of code here versus the eleven we saw earlier. Sure. Okay. Now let's get a little more complicated. Now let's throw in a date. And I say this makes it a little more, bit more complicated. I pointed back to the uh, transaction record table. Well, now we're, in order to get the date, we've got to join the transaction, ta uh, transaction record table to the query. Simple enough. But make sure you make that join, because if you don't, now you're going to get an erroneous result set, and it looks really funny. And if you don't know any better, you're going to be going, wow, this is great. And, but everything is just totally out of whack in terms of the numbers. Uh, so definitely make sure you make that join. Um, and we only went two levels deep this time. So now we have the result of that. And you see we're only going down one dot. So it's business.office supplies, education.miscellaneous, entertainment.dining. Discounts, discounts doesn't have but uh, one level, so it did catch that. But again, you see the, the results of just going down two levels deep. But now this is all between, effectively this is a year-to-date transaction. I don't know if you paid attention to my dates, but it, I started January 1st through December 31st. So this is the year-to-date as of the time I took that screenshot. Okay, now we get really, really complicated. Actually, we're, it's not really all that complicated. It's really the same query as before, except what we're doing now is we're just wanting to see the groceries up by themselves. Yeah, the left angle bracket with the at sign or aroba. Um, that actually means anything underneath of groceries. So you're going to specify your category that you want to see, the specific category you want to see here with this, and it will show you everything underneath the, the groceries category as far down your tree as you want to go. In this case, I just went two levels deep. So what we get is groceries.food and groceries.beverages. Yes. By the way, notice that I, I kept the group by exactly the same as my select statement up here. Yes, that's right. I, I don't know how to get around that at this point. Maybe I should have. Yeah. I think what he's saying is. 
have us say group by category. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Why, group. Why do we all go to the front? Why do we have to have all three? I just want to group by subcategory. You know what? I wonder. I wonder if I change this. Well, it doesn't matter what, what it is because I have exactly the same thing in my query as many people. Yeah. The, the select doesn't match the group by. Yeah. Bars. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, exactly. There's more to explore. Uh, you know, I know we're kind of starting to run short on time here, I think. Uh, or am I, did I move through this faster than I think? 3.45? Oh, gosh, I got, I got another 20 minutes. <laughs> Um, if we count the time that I left it alone for a while and got sick and tired of playing with anything and uh, had other things on my mind and all that fun stuff, I was at this for probably about a year. But uh, once I actually inquired about, once somebody suggested L-Tree and I was like, I don't understand how to do L-Tree. I don't know how to, but I went and I found in the doc, right there in the PostgreSQL documentation, um, you know, you can, it tells you what L tree module is. It even tells you how to install the add on, the contrib package, and all of that. Um, but I, I, I just figured this might be valuable for some people and might be worth uh, knowing about yeah. because, you know, maybe an hour here might save you a couple of months of frustration. Yes, there are, yeah, I was, that's one of the things I was hoping is that people would be able to see how to apply this to their own problems that they want to solve. Uh, I have not, I am not aware of this being available in MySQL, SQL, SQL Server, or Oracle, or whatever. Um, I'm just not aware of anything like this being available in any other database system. And, you know, that's... <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, when I actually asked about this on, on the SQL list, and I'm, you know, I'm subscribed to PostgreSQL General, PostgreSQL SQL, and uh, Newbie, and, uh, but when I asked about this, guys were like, hmm. <laughs> well, well, about hierarchical structures. And uh, even talking with the guy, uh, what is it, Dave, that was here from PostgreSQL today, or this weekend, uh, even he was kind of like, well, I think when you ask that question, a lot of people are thinking of hierarchical database systems rather than hierarchical data structures in, you know. But, and again, it, I think it's kind of a confusing question, um, but, the idea of pulling hierarchical data into a relational database, yeah, yeah. it just doesn't, yeah. Um, I got into, oh, thank you. I got into a fight with my uh, DBA 110 professor at CPCC, Jason. You'll love this, by the way. She, she deri um, when I was asking about this from her perspective, 
And, you know, she's an oracle. She's more familiar with oracle and MSSQL. But she was, she, she told me, she said, you know, uh, why are you even using PostgreSQL? It's not a big database. And I went, uh, well, when you say it's not a big database, do you mean like it's not very popular, or do you mean that it can't handle a lot of data? And she said, well, you know, the only place we ever used it here was in a class, and it was only used for indexing purposes, and it just can't handle terabytes and terabytes of data. I was writing, you know, we're, it's a lab class, guys. Biggest PostgreSQL database. Boom. Tap, boom, here comes Google with the result. There's an article about Yahoo back in 2008 claiming to run the world's largest database on no less than PostgreSQL at two petabytes of data. <laughs> I th well, I started with MySQL, and I liked their documentation. Their, their how to get up and running documentation yeah. is actually better than the PostgreSQL how to get up and running documentation. The information is in the PostgreSQL docs, but you actually have to go to like two or three different sections to figure out how to get up and running. Um, so if you don't know, you just have to look for, hopefully somebody's got a tutorial out there. But MySQL does very well at that part. Um, but I have to admit, Postgres has really good documentation. You're absolutely right. Huh? Yeah, they seem to be a pretty nice community. They don't, no, nobody's told me RTFM yet, you know. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, now, I did get recommended when I asked, I think I was asking about this question on the newbie list, and they went, you know, maybe you should ask that one on the general list or the SQL list, because uh, that was, you know, much more advanced than newbie type stuff. So, um, But like I say, I just hope that helps, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> and I, I, I think that this is actually, I think L-Tree actually is, it kind of, it's like it, I want to say it is an index. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you can combine indexing I think like B-Tree and other yeah. uh, indexing with it, but in some cases you won't get, no, won't necessarily get the performance you boost. Yeah. Yeah. So you can index might not. Thanks for coming, man. Thank you. I don't know, I'm not school. So. Good. Can I have a copy of my presentation? Yeah, I need to make that available anyway. Oh, can I Yeah. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. 
Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources, and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think, 
When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the Cloud Stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Astris. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Astris, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astrospace systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astris or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astris. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.